Now you're ready. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Future Proof Universal RDMA, presented by Cavium and the Lindley Group. Before we begin, we wanted to cover a few housekeeping items. At the bottom of your audience council are multiple application widgets you can use if you use. If you have any questions during the webcast, you can click on the Q&A widget at the bottom and submit your question. We will try to answer these at the time of the webcast, but if a fuller answer is needed or we run out of time, it will be answered later via email. We do capture all questions. A copy of today's slide deck is available in the resource list widget that looks like a green folder at the bottom of your screen. You can expand your slide area by clicking on the maximize icon on the top right of the slide area or by dragging the bottom right corner of the slide area. If you have any technical difficulties, please click on the help widget. It has a question mark icon and covers common technical issues. An on-demand version of the webcast will be available approximately one day after the webcast and can be accessed using the same audience link that was sent to you earlier. Today we have two accomplished speakers and technologists and a packed agenda. Nishat Loda is a product marketing manager at Cavium based in the San Francisco Bay Area. Nishant leads the charter on Ethernet markets, evangelization of emerging technologies, and performance optimization for networking, storage, and cloud systems. He has over 15 years of industry experience. Bob Wheeler is a principal analyst for networking at the Lindley Group, which he joined in 2001. He has more than 30 years of experience in the networking, PC, and semiconductor industries. The Lindley Group is the leading supplier of independent technology analysis in semiconductors and is the publisher of microprocessor reports. In today's presentation, Bob will cover how some of the emerging cloud and storage technologies are driving the need for low latency Ethernet solution that leverages RDMA, Rocky, or iWarp. He will talk about RDMA options available for the Ethernet fabric and factors that should determine your choice of RDMA. Nishat will then dive deeper in various use cases that have the potential to leverage RDMA access uh, excuse me, across hyper-converged and disaggregated storage platforms. Nishant will also share the findings resulting from an in-depth performance characterization of RDMA use cases and how Cavium Technologies provide customers with the ultimate choice and flexibility. Together, Bob and Nishant will then take your questions in the last 10 to 15 minutes of the presentation. At the end of the Q&A session, I will be announcing the winner of the GoPro camera. I will now turn the call over to Bob Wheeler, Principal Analyst with the Lindley Group. Bob? Thank you, Angel, and welcome, everyone. As Angel mentioned, I'm going to start off talking about a few trends, give some hard background on RDMA technologies, and then uh, pass it over to Nishant. So to start with some high-level trends that are relevant to RDMA, uh, first of all, 25 gig Ethernet is um, poised to ramp. It delivers a huge price performance boost over 10 gigabit Ethernet. Um, it actually started to ramp into high volume in 2016, but that was driven primarily by hyperscale data center operators. The beauty of 25 gig E is that it delivers 2.5x the throughput of 10 gig E with a very small premium since it operates uh, over the same um, single lane that 10 gig E uses. And so now in 2017, the stage is set for much broader adoption. The IEEE approved the 25 gigabit Ethernet standard last June. Uh, Intel's new Perly platform, which just launched, um, is, is out, and the OEM platforms based on Perly offer new 25 gigabit Ethernet options. Uh, top of rack switches are available from multiple OEMs, including Arista, Cisco, Juniper, et cetera. And there are multiple media options for 25 gig Ethernet, including uh, direct attached cabling or copper, um, as well as fiber media options and the SFP28 uh, form factor for modules. Another big trend that everybody's well aware of is that. Uh, uh, Flash-based storage is quickly displacing uh, hard disks in data centers pretty much everywhere except for in uh, cold storage. Um, this has been uh, going on for some time. 
Um, but the other things that are happening in parallel are the adoption of NVM Express, uh, which moves the SSD interface to PCI Express. And the important piece here is that it removes the SCSI protocol layer that was used in SAS, um, thereby reducing latency and also pro protocol processing overhead. The, the exciting thing that's happening now is that uh, there is the ability to move NVMe storage onto a fabric using the NVMe over fabric specification, which was released in 2016. So now you can extend the NVMe protocol across the network. Um, it is worth noting that there are different flavors of NVMe over fabrics. So there are protocols for Ethernet, a protocol for InfiniBand, and a protocol for Fiber Channel. Um, so there are multiple flavors of NVMe OF. The version for Ethernet takes advantage of RDMA, which is a good match for the queues um, that are used in the NVMe architecture. Uh, and we're, we expect to see NVMe over fabrics all flash arrays coming to market in 2018. Some startups will have systems this year, but uh, we'll see broader availability next year. There are also some high-level architectural changes occurring, um, both in the enterprise and in the cloud. And these are also relevant uh, to the discussion today. First of all, hyperconvergence is happening in the enterprise infrastructure. Um, the idea of hyperconvergence is that you're able to combine compute with software-defined storage and networking. It essentially, it takes a public cloud architecture and it scales it down to the box or rack level. Um, that makes it a very good fit with hybrid cloud. Hybrid cloud has been um, something of great interest, but hasn't seen great adoption yet. Um, the idea of hybrid cloud is that it enables the elasticity of resources between the uh, public cloud and the private cloud. Uh, but of course, that requires a common framework to enable workload mobility. So that's finally happening. Um, VMware Cloud on Amazon Web Services will be released uh, this summer. And Microsoft has announced that the Azure stack will ship in September. So here you have two major uh, frameworks that will support hybrid cloud, and we should start to see an acceleration in the adoption of hybrid cloud. Um, disaggregation is another big picture trend that has been happening um, in kind of fits and starts because it requires some very major architectural changes. Uh, and so the first thing we see is the move to pooled storage. Um, the, the promise of disaggregation is that you'll also be able to separate compute and memory, um, but that's um, still down the road. So switching gears to RDMA. Um, what's, what's driving the need for RDMA? Um, first of all, server virtualization has increased the average utilization of servers. It used to be that servers had a lot of uh, free cycles, and so the cycles burned on networking um, were, were available. With virtualization, they're really, in some cases, are, are no longer free cycles because, uh, for example, a cloud provider wants to be able to sell those cycles as compute instances. Um, and in any case, the, the utilization of servers is much higher in the area of virtualization. Uh, secondly, server connectivity is moving from 10 gigabit Ethernet to 25 gigabit Ethernet. So that will multiply the network processing overhead associated with the network interface. And then the rapid adoption of SSDs within data centers. Um, the fact is with SSDs that storage media is often no longer the performance bottleneck. And so for storage applications now, the, the network stack becomes more significant. Um, and SSD performance will increase further as, uh, as people adopt NVMe as, a, as a, an alternative to SAS, um, again, reducing overhead. Something else is that uh, cloud architectures increase parallelism. Uh, what we see in public cloud architectures, for example, is that the distributed processing that's used in the cloud looks very much like uh, high-performance computing architectures. Um, with increased parallelism, then the latency of communication between multiple nodes becomes more important. 
So kind of backing up a step, what is RDMA? Um, the, the idea behind RDMA is that in, in the network stack and network processing, uh, moving data around is a major source of overhead, specifically data copying. So on a conventional networking stack, the uh, packets are stored in operating system memory, and then later they have to be copied to user space or application memory. This copying introduces latency, and it consumes CPU resources. And if uh, that's happening through the kernel, you end up with context switches. And so the idea behind RDMA is that the NIC is able to write data directly into application memory and avoid the uh, data copy as well as um, getting the kernel involved. However, because the NIC needs to know where to place that data in memory, the network protocol, the wire protocol, must explicitly support RDMA. And so the first such protocol to achieve widespread adoption was InfiniBand. And you do have to have um, a protocol on, on both ends of the wire that handles, uh, or a node on both ends of the wire that handle that RDMA protocol. So we've included uh, a diagram here, which you can reference later. But basically, what you see is on the left side, a conventional stack going up through the kernel. And on the right side, the RDMA, uh, where data bypasses the kernel, goes directly into user space. So there are two flavors of RDMA over Ethernet that are in use today and available. The first one was developed by the InfiniBand Trade Association, and it's known as ROCKE, uh, R-O-C-E. The original version of ROCKE dates back to 2010 and uh, basically adapted InfiniBand technology to Ethernet. Uh, because InfiniBand was designed for a lossless, uh, to be a lossless network, uh, the Rocky protocol requires the underlying Ethernet network to be essentially lossless. That means that you have to configure the Ethernet network with data center bridge, bridging protocols and, in particular, priority-based flow control, or PFC. And so with Rocky, all of the switches in the data path must have PFC enabled and configured. Um, the original version of Rocky, which we'll call Rocky V1, although that's not an official designation, uh, uses the InfiniBand network and transport layers over a layer 2 Ethernet network. Um, the restriction with Rocky V1 is that means that your Rocky traffic is limited to a single subnet. So in 2014, the IP IBTA delivered Rocky V2, which replaces the network layer, the InfiniBand network layer, with UDP and IP, and that therefore enables layer 3 routing, and it also is compatible with ECMP load balancing. There's a continuing effort to improve the performance um, and user friendliness of Rocky, and so one of the things that was uh, included in Rocky V2 is an optional congestion management protocol called RCM. RCM uses explicit congestion notification, which is a feature that's available in uh, most current Ethernet switches, um, and it uses that to enable end-to-end -end congestion notification. Basically, when a receiving NIC uh, sees a packet marked um, with uh, ECN, it um, basically notifies the sending NIC, and then the sending NIC reduces its transmission rate to um, mitigate the congestion. However, RCM specifies a, a wire protocol, uh, but it doesn't, re doesn't specify the algorithm that's actually used by the sending NIC to uh, reduce its transmission rate. In uh, 2015, there was a paper presented at SIGCOM um, that describes DCQCN. Um, DCQCN is an algorithm that builds on top of RCM and handles that um, back-off algorithm on the sending NIC. It also removes the requirement to use VLANs uh, by carrying the uh, priority, packet priority, in the DSCP field, which is an IP header field. 
Microsoft has deployed DCQCN at a very large scale in its Azure data centers and has published uh, subsequent papers on uh, the performance of DCQCN at a large scale. The other flavor of RDMA for Ethernet is called iWARP, and it builds on TCP. iWARP has been around for a long time. The original development started back in 2002 with a number of industry leaders getting together to develop specifications. It was then standardized through a series of IETF RFCs, and the iWARP protocol suite uh, includes several underlying protocols, an RDMA protocol, a, a direct data placement protocol, and, and a framing protocol that make up what people refer to as iWARP. Compared with Rocky, the major advantage of iWARP is that it operates over standard Ethernet and IP fabrics without the need for DCB or PFC, um, and that's because TCP provides a reliable connection as well as proven congestion control. So iWARP eliminates the need to do any special configuration of your switch infrastructure. So here's just a diagram illustrating the three different stacks and you can see iWARP is based on TCP transport, whereas Rocky V2 uses the IB transport protocol over the stateless uh, UDP and IP. So here's another comparison of the scalability of these different RDMA protocols. The original Rocky um, was not routable, Rocky V2, uh, was routable and is compatible with ECMP. It provides point-to-point -point flow control using PFC. If you add uh, the Rocky congestion management and DCQCN, then you get end-to-end -end congestion control, but you still have the underlying requirement for DCB. And iWARP provides end-to-end -end, uh, congestion control with by using the TCP protocol. Um, and that handles the congestion avoidance, but the underlying network is not a lossless network unless you also configure uh, ECB and uh, PFC protocols. So the ecosystem has developed significantly um, for RDMA. The, across the two different flavors, there are kind of two camps. And um, one camp supporting Rocky includes Broadcom, Cavium, and Mellanox with Rocky-enabled mix. The available products range from 10 gigabit Ethernet all the way up to 100 gigabit Ethernet speeds, and all of the available products support both the original Rocky and Rocky V2. In the iWARP camp, uh, we have Cavium, Chelsea, and Intel that provide iWARP-enabled network interfaces. And these also cover the range of 10 gigabit Ethernet all the way up to 100 gigabit Ethernet speeds. Uh, I'd like to note that Intel's new Perly platform, which is the Xeon scalable platform that just launched, includes a, an iWARP-enabled 10 gigabit Ethernet controller. It's actually a quad port 10 gig, gigabit Ethernet controller that is integrated in the Lewisburg uh, chipset. So Intel now supports iWARP in the um, basic Perly platform. It's also worth noting that Cavium is the only vendor that actually supports both Rocky and iWARP, and the FastLink product family supports both of these protocols concurrently. And so this is the unique capability that we refer to here as universal RDMA for Ethernet. So how do you go about choosing an RDMA protocol? The majority of operating systems and applications now support both iWARP and Rocky. iWARP is the leader in terms of ease of deployment. Your RDMA traffic can span large-scale networks without any special configuration. But if you have packet loss in your network, you will experience increases in latency. So if your goal is minimum latency, um, you have to make sure that you don't have a lossy or congested network. Rocky can deliver superior performance when it's properly deployed because it uses the underlying lossless Ethernet network 
to provide deterministic latency. Um, without loss, you have a bounded latency, and that will deliver maximum performance for your storage applications. However, it requires the network admin to configure the switches for VLANs and PFC, and uh, therefore we think that Rocky is best suited to relatively small-scale environments, um, unless, of course, you're someone on the scale of Microsoft with a very large uh, team that can um, optimize the network and, and the deployment. So with that, I would like to pass it over to Nishant, who is going to talk about the use cases for RDMA. Nishant? Thank you, Bob. Uh, there's definitely a lot going on in the compute, storage, and networking technologies that shape the cloud and enterprise data centers around us. Uh, at one hand, while our architectures, enterprise architectures and cloud architectures are evolving towards higher workload density with more VMs, a bunch of containers running on a single compute node, uh, and storage bottlenecks have been removed with the advent of NVMe, uh, the way I look at it is um, the focus has now shifted on the network, and uh, that's where 25 gig Ethernet and Ethernet-based RDMA now comprise a well-developed ecosystem that are accelerating and offloading the I.O. needs of next-generation applications. Uh, from your perspective, uh, as a data center architect, a solution partner, or a customer, you have some amazing choices of technologies. And for RDMA, these are Rocky and iWarp, uh, like Bob mentioned, and each of these Rocky and iWarp have distinct use cases, and I believe that they will coexist in the data center for the time to come. In the next few slides, uh, me, Nishant, and I will uh, go into a little bit more detail on the RDMA use cases. I'll talk about some of the well-established use cases as well as emerging ones uh, around Ethernet-based RDMA. I'll also give you uh, suggestions and recommendations as to how you would go about making the choice between the different types of RDMA, Rocky or iWork. So let's uh, look at what are the different RDMA use cases by application. So uh, starting from the top left and going clockwise, uh, one of the dominant use cases today for RDMA, both Rocky and iWarp, is hyper-converged infrastructure, and that deployment and that architecture is being led today by Microsoft Windows Storage Spaces Direct. And this allows you to aggregate uh, networking, uh, uh, aggregate storage and compute resources together and allow, the, allow you to scale them uh, all together and creating a single set uh, of infrastructure that serves uh, your compute as well as storage needs. And RDMA has uh, the potential to accelerate uh, this kind of workloads. Let's talk about disaggregated storage. And within disaggregated storage, I'll start off by um, one uh, very emerging use case, which is NVMe over fabrics, the ability to scale the potential of NVMe across a fabric. And <clears throat> marrying NVMe with RDMA provides a high-speed connectivity and scalability to your NVMe-based storage appliances. Um, um, further on, within disaggregated storage is ICER, iSCSI extensions over RDMA. And what ICER does is it allows you to use your standard iSCSI protocol, but accelerates that by taking it over a low latency fabric like RDMA. There are multiple different choices for ICER, both from initiators as well as target subsystems. And in my next few slides, I'll kind of go over in more detail on each one of these uh, uh, use cases for RDMA. Uh, within Microsoft Windows, there is also disaggregated storage architectures that leverage uh, SMB Direct, um, available in Microsoft Windows 2012 as well as 2016. Low latency virtual machines, this is a recent new introduction uh, by VMware ESX where you can have workloads running uh, within VMs in a virtualized environment uh, with a hypervisor as VMware ESX. Uh, the ability for those workloads uh, to leverage RDMA and get extremely low latency and acceleration. In terms of file systems, everybody has heard about NFS, and NFS today has the potential uh, to accelerate file accesses using RDMA as a transport protocol underneath it. 
similarly, for CEPHs, actually very recently, uh, maybe a couple of months ago, CEPHs added uh, experimental support uh, uh, for RDMA using its async messenger uh, option. And, <clears throat> and as you, many of you guys know, CEPHs, uh, highly distributed, no single point of failure uh, file system, but the acceleration that RDMA will bring to CEPHs will make CEPHs more scalable, higher performance, lower latency. And last but not the least uh, is VM migration, which is the ability to move VMs across uh, from a source to destination server. And uh, today, uh, VM migration with Windows Server 2012 and 2016 can leverage RDMA. And I'll share with you some of some performance metrics that we have gathered as to how RDMA can accelerate VM migration. Moving on to the next slide, I give you a similar look uh, like my previous slide on RDMA use cases, but this time cut by operating system. So you have a better view of, uh, um, depending upon your operating system of choice, what RDMA options do you have? Uh, let's start with Windows. Uh, Windows <coughs> definitely leads the charter uh, on the most complete and broad support uh, for Ethernet-based RDMA. It started off in Windows Server 2012 and multiple enhancements done uh, in Windows Server 2016 and Hyper-V to allow workloads uh, running within VMs to leverage all the three different types of Ethernet-based uh, RDMA, be it Rocky, the routable version Rocky V2, as well as iWarp. And some of these use cases, like I mentioned earlier, are storage spaces direct, the hyper-converged, uh, as well as the disaggregated storage models, like migration or VM migration. And underlying all of that is Microsoft's uh, uh, RDMA-enabled file system that we call as SMB Direct, Server Message Block Direct. Let's uh, uh, talk about Linux. Uh, and well, Linux leads in the innovation charter with uh, the community all around contributing. And uh, today, Linux has the most well-developed um, stack for NVMe or Fabrics, um, um, multiple different options available to accelerate and scale out NVMe or a Fabric, including Rocky, Rocky V2, as well as iWarp. Uh, Linux also supports uh, iSER, iSCSI extensions or RDMA, and in fact, for both NVMe or Fabrics, as well as uh, iSER, uh, Linux provides an end-to-end uh, solution in terms of uh, um, designing and implementing both uh, initiator as well as a storage target or a JBOF uh, having NVMe or Fabrics and iSER capabilities. Uh, from cloud file systems, um, uh, SAPs and certainly NFS, uh, <coughs> they today support um, uh, RDMA. Another uh, kind of very uh, new development for Linux is SPDK or Storage Performance Data Plane Kit. Uh, if you guys know about DPDK, what DPDK does uh, to networking where it accelerates networking performance by handling uh, packets in user space and in pole mode, SPDK is a similar architecture that leverages a lot of DPDK to allow people who are designing storage arrays, especially with NVMe, to uh, utilize the potential of the high performance that a user space computing paradigm uh, brings in. And so uh, a lot of uh, customers that I talk to are considering, and uh, many of them are in advanced stages of developing uh, NVMe-based storage, uh, external storage platforms, leveraging the high performance and low latency characteristics of the SPDK platform and architecture. Let's talk about VMware ESXi, and uh, <clears throat> VMware has uh, made some investments into RDMA and supporting Ethernet-based RDMA for its flagship uh, uh, hypervisor, ESXi. Today, they support both Rocky as well as uh, uh, Rocky V2, and <clears throat> um, PVRDMA, which is para-virtualized RDMA, is uh, the use case that allows virtual machines uh, to leverage RDMA and get low-latency traffic. ISER is on the roadmap for VMware ESX, and uh, um, I believe in the near future, VMware plans to support ISER as an initiator. Uh, once again, ISER would allow you to transport iSCSI blocks over RDMA and make it high performance as well as efficient. Uh, last but not the least is uh, FreeBSD, again, support for NVMe over Fabrics, and a whole bunch of uh, OFED, which is a library uh, for verbs, applications that can run on top of RDMA. And not a 
a week or a month goes by without me hearing about new use cases being developed around RDMA. Everything that Bob talked about, the changes going on all around us, that is driving the need to, for RDMA and <clears throat> applications and operating systems are evolving uh, uh, to uh, meet those needs. Like I said, I'll go into a little bit more detail on each one of my uh, use cases that I articulated earlier. And the first one here, uh, and uh, my favorite, uh, is the Storage Spaces Direct, which is a hyper-converged infrastructure based on Windows Server 2016. <clears throat> and that uh, allows you basically to build a, a cluster where you combine storage and compute nodes together to form a hyper-converged uh, uh, infrastructure. Um, you have the ability to scale both compute uh, as well as storage resources together in a single <clears throat> by adding uh, nodes which have both compute as well as storage resources. So if I look at a logical uh, diagram on how a Windows uh, Server 2016 based hyper-converged deployment would look like. So you have a whole bunch uh, of servers uh, with disk drives, NVMe drives, SSD connected together uh, with a storage uh, fabric. And I'll shortly get to uh, what that storage fabric comprises of. And each one of these Hyper-V nodes uh, have uh, um, VMs running on them and their own uh, drives. and uh, the storage fabric kind of brings all of this together uh, so that resources can be pooled, volumes can be shared, and virtual machines can be migrated across these set of clusters. And all of this is can be built using industry standard x86 uh, uh, servers. The choice of connectivity is 10 gig or 25 gig. RDMA is a very popular option uh, in these kinds of deployments. And in fact, for any larger scale, more than a couple of nodes deployment of S to D, RDMA is recommended. Uh, now, let's talk about how would you go about choosing which type of RDMA protocol would you use for the SMB storage fabric? And you have choices, which is a good thing. One of the choices is uh, Rocky V2 based RDMA. Now, if you can um, develop maintain and tune a lossless network, Rocky is a great choice. It will give you deterministic uh, low latency and <clears throat> a better performance. Uh, but uh, what I recommend to customers that if you have a well-managed network or provision network that you don't think is prone to congestion, Rocky V2 is a great choice. But if you cannot afford some of those uh, uh, luxuries, you have choices. And once again, iWarp is a type of RDMA. Uh, that allows you, uh, you doesn't require a lossless Ethernet fabric underneath it. You do not need to configure uh, uh, PFC, DSCP, things like that. Uh, and uh, the network itself uh, could potentially be um, congestion prone. And in those cases, uh, iWarp is a great choice. And I recommend uh, for any very large size deployments, uh, perhaps iWarp is a good choice. Or when you have a network that you don't uh, control is not lossless, uh, are prone to congestion, then iWarp is a great choice. But <clears throat> kind of the, the point that I want to make is that uh, um, you need options in your portfolio between Rocky and iWarp. Your use cases, even within your own data centers, could could be different, um, and in some cases you may want to use Rocky, in some cases you may want to use uh, iWarp, and uh, having options is always a good thing. Let's go further and talk about uh, another use case within Microsoft Windows, uh, leveraging storage spaces direct, but this time building ag disaggregated uh, storage. And why, with disaggregated storage, I mean where your compute resources or Hyper-V VMs run on separate servers uh, versus um, where your storage resides. <clears throat> so in this case, uh, you have two fabrics that come into play, and I like to call them the front-end fabric and the back-end uh, fabric. I generally recommend that for the front-end uh, fabric, uh, iWarp is a good uh, choice because often the front-end fabric could be scaling out to multiple different uh, uh, hundreds of nodes, and uh, the network that uh, manages or that uh, provides the infrastructure for the front-end fabric uh, may be large spread uh, 
<clears throat> required to be scalable and uh, perhaps not entirely under your control. And then iWarp is a great choice, but doesn't require you to tweak with uh, the network and can adapt to the needs of the network. Uh, but the backend uh, uh, fabric, which is likely to be better controlled across uh, a fewer nodes that provide uh, the scale out file servers, Rocky V2 is a great choice if you can uh, get a lossless network uh, up and running. But <clears throat> these are one of uh, the two kind of key use cases is um, uh, both on uh, disaggregated storage as well as hyperconverged storage. Uh, um, moving on, let's talk about NVMe over fabrics, uh, <coughs> a, a relatively brand new technology standardized uh, sometime probably uh, mid of uh, last year, um, if I get my facts right. Uh, and what NVMe over fabrics does, it allows you to scale the reach of NVMe across a larger scale fabric. Uh, and that fabric in this case uh, can be RDMA with both Rocky uh, as well as iWarp. And marrying low latency characteristics of NVMe with low latency high performance RDMA is a great choice. It allows you kind of to scale, still continue to deliver the high performance as well as low latency of NVMe, but across your network. Uh, industry standard is scalable, it's efficient, RDMA offloads the networking stack onto uh, the next and um, there is literally no bottlenecks for you to scale out NVMe over the fabrics. Uh, today the solutions exist for both uh, building both initiators or hosts as well as uh, targets. You have uh, choices between using uh, Rocky or iWarp or Rocky V2, Rocky or iWarp uh, uh, across the Ethernet uh, uh, fabric. Uh, from a target side infrastructure, a lot of work going, is going on on the target side infrastructure. People developing external storage arrays uh, uh, with NVMe drives and uh, NVMe over fabrics, as well as uh, JBOFs uh, with Ethernet connectivity. And they are making the choice uh, of Ethernet-based RDMA to scale out NVMe over the fabrics. A lot of customers that I talk to who are developing target side uh, uh, systems, uh, they do not know whether these targets or JBOFs will have hosts that would uh, come via iWarp or via Rocky. So they would like to have the options of both Rocky and iWarp to meet a heterogeneous set of hosts as well as adapt to the customer's network. So once again, having choices is a good thing. It depends on your skill, depends on um, your target applications, your network, and uh, things like that. Okay, let's talk about ICER. Everybody's familiar with iSCSI. ICER is pretty much iSCSI over RDMA or Rocky or uh, uh, iWarp, uh, Rocky, Rocky V2 or iWarp. And today you have end-to-end -end support in Linux, like I mentioned earlier. You can develop initiators, targets. In fact, there are some vendors out there that provide iSCSI-based storage arrays to and VMware is uh, soon going to introduce uh, ICER-based uh, initiators within their flagship uh, hypervisor. Now, let's... Uh, look at some performance metrics on how ICER would compare to host-based iSCSI. On the left, I have a quick latency comparison and where you can see that uh, um, software iSCSI going over the standard TCP IP stack can have pretty significantly high latency and RDMA with its low latency characteristics uh, literally reduces the latency by one third and in this case, less is a good thing. Uh, faster IOs, uh, better response time for applications uh, but storage guys, are not just about latency, it is about IOPS, it's about transactions per second, uh, it's about parallelism, it's about deep queues, and here is a comparison on the right uh, on how ICER IOPS compare with uh, host-based or software iSCSI, and clearly you can see for some block sizes that I picked up here uh, um, that um, ICER provides significantly better performance than iSCSI. It's, uh, it's the efficiencies of RDMA that uh, help accelerate the SCSI traffic across the wire and ecosystem for ICER is well developed but you can leverage them for your applications um, uh, whether it's Rocky, Rocky V2 or iWarp. Uh, let's talk about the live migration <clears throat> and uh, live migration is the ability to move VMs um, across the wire from source to destination. Now one of the challenges with live migration is that it's typically triggered uh, when the server that hosts the VM is overloaded and you need to move some resources or some VMs or some workloads out of this server to kind of balance things out. But the process of moving the VMs can put extraordinary load on this already overloaded
overloaded server and that is not a good choice that's not a good option uh, the rdma to the rescue it's fully offloaded it allows you to move vms uh, from this server quickly efficiently um, and helps so the, the shorter the time your vms are in flight the lower the less risk and the less load they put on this already overloaded server during the migration process uh, uh, kind of not complicates your things uh, further. And uh, here is a quick uh, kind of performance uh, uh, chart that compares how two concurrent, four concurrent, and six concurrent VMs across a number of different iterations uh, and the time to move these VMs compare across standard TCP IP uh, versus uh, RDMA. In this case, I chose iWarp uh, to demonstrate the benefits of live migration. and. Uh, you can clearly see that um, uh, with TCP IP, it takes significantly longer to move the VMs. Uh, <clears throat> not only that, uh, uh, when we were moving uh, two VMs, it is quite possible that you can burn a couple of cores in just in the process of moving the VMs, which is terrible on this over already overloaded system. While if you use RDMA, it's memory to memory copy the system will not burn resources on moving this VM and uh, that is what exactly you want to get uh, <clears throat> into a optimized DRS uh, scenario. Let's talk about some uh, um, relatively emerging uh, and uh, new developments around RDMA, and uh, that is CEPS over RDMA. And everybody's familiar with uh, CEPS, a highly distributed, no single point of failure um, file system, open source, uh, good uh, data protection, uh, data replication features inbuilt into it. Uh, uh, very recently, um, CEPS added uh, for now, experimental support about, uh, with RDMA. Even though CEPS has just introduced this support for RDMA, I see a lot of customers jumping in to evaluate and support this open source effort, and that kind of shows the interest uh, of customers who are looking to deploy a CEPS-based uh, distributed file system to accelerate it uh, with RDMA. NFS, um, a longtime favorite, um, uh, has been leveraging RDMA for a while. It's, uh, NFS over RDMA is uh, in production today. So if you guys are a NFS friendly shop, you guys like NFS, consider accelerating it uh, using RDMA. It is seamless. There is no change required uh, to your applications. Just uh, newer versions of NFS uh, do support uh, RDMA, both Rocky, uh, Rocky V2 as well as uh, iWarp. And again, when you would choose Rocky V2 versus when you would choose iWarp and kind of reiterating what I said earlier, it depends. If you can afford a lossless network, if you have a well-managed network that doesn't uh, is not prone to congestion, use Rocky, you will get uh, very good performance. Uh, and uh, if you have a network that you do not entirely manage, uh, could be prone to congestion. iWarp is a great choice. It'll give you consistent performance uh, uh, without you requiring to enable a lossless network or tweaking uh, uh, with the DCQCN and ECN settings on your switches and things like that. It kind of, it's a mix of uh, skill set required to maintain the network, the type of network, uh, as well as uh, the application. So having uh, put all of that kind of behind us, just to quickly refresh your memories. Uh, RDMA, both Rocky and Rocky V2 have distinct use cases across the data center. There's a well-developed ecosystem uh, out there uh, with Microsoft Windows, Linux, VMware, FreeBSD, supporting a whole bunch of applications uh, around NVMe or Fabrics, uh, disaggregated, disaggregated storage with ICER, uh, hyperconverged storage uh, with storage spaces direct, uh, CEPHs, uh, um, and a whole bunch of interesting uh, stuff. But all that behind, let me quickly talk about uh, <clears throat> what are some of uh, the Cavium Ethernet NIC portfolio and how universal RDMA, like Bob mentioned, which is the ability to concurrently do Rocky as well as uh, iWarp, uh, play into the Cavium Ethernet NIC portfolio. So Cavium universal network adapters comprise of two large families. Uh, one is the liquid I.O. set of adapters or networking adapters, Ethernet adapters, and the other one is the Fastlink uh, uh, set of Ethernet NICs. Now Fastlink comes to Cavium from the QLogic uh, 
uh, uh, acquisition and uh, liquid IO is Cavium's highly programmable intelligent adapters, which are available across 10, 25, and 40 gig Ethernet. They are completely programmable uh, by the customer uh, to offload specific workloads, or they have options. Uh, uh, liquid IO has options to fully offload the OVS. Uh, um, onto the NIC as well as crypto acceleration with IPsec and SSL offload. Uh, Fastlink is the product that we have been talking about um, all this while. It, kind of, uh, it supports uh, universal RDMA, which is Rocky, Rocky V1, V2, iWarp, uh, uh, give you the ultimate choice uh, available across multiple different speeds, 10, 25, 40, 50, all the way to 100 gigabit uh, uh, Ethernet and uh, available from multiple different OEMs, ODMs in different form factors. You like OCP cards, you like standard cards, ALOMs, um, uh, mezzanine, uh, the works. Um, certainly both of these uh, have uh, both liquid IO as well as Fastlink share a whole bunch of common features. Uh, everything that you expect uh, from L2 NIC, um, stateless offloads, uh, tunneling overlays, uh, SRIOV, OpenStack, DPDK, and uh, uh, both of these technologies are well integrated into applications and businesses around enterprise, cloud, as well as uh, uh, storage architectures. Um, slightly more deeper dive uh, on a specific product family that we recently announced um, like four weeks back, uh, that's uh, the Fastlink 41,000 series family from Cavium. It's our second generation 1025 gig uh, NIC, uh, supports 10 gig, 25 gig, even some 40 and 50 gigabit uh, speeds. Some really interesting things that we introduced uh, in this uh, product is, one of them is a technology called Smart AN or Smart Auto Negotiation that automatically detects uh, the type of cable um, that is connected to the NIC, the type of switch we are connecting to, figures out what is the right settings in speed, forward error correction algorithms, and brings the link up uh, without requiring your manual intervention. Makes life easy, and who doesn't want to make life uh, uh, easy? A secure firmware update, uh, make sure that um, no rogue components uh, get installed on the NIC. We validate uh, um, images to make sure that they are authenticated. Um, whole bunch of overlay offloads, VXLAN and VGRE and Geneve uh, uh, for people deploying uh, multi-tenant platforms. Uh, we talked about universal RDMA, um, Rocky, V2, iWarp, uh, full support for DPDK, uh, millions of packets per uh, second performance with DPDK, OpenStack integration, as well as uh, some very emerging things uh, like MPLS or uh, UDP uh, integrated into DPDK. Storage offloads, uh, like I said, you see many of the use cases uh, uh, for RDMA around storage offloads or storage uh, I.O. We support um, standard iSCSI, FCOE, ISER, which we talked about, iSCSI extensions over RDMA, SMB Direct, uh, uh, storage spaces direct, uh, NVMe over fabrics, as well as a technology called NVMe Direct, which allows direct interaction between RDMA and NIC and a NVMe drive over PCIe. And all of this is backed by a flexible architecture. And in this case, when I say flexible, it means that we as Cavium have the ability to change uh, and modify um, um, the NIC to suit emerging technologies for faster time to market uh, so that your investment in uh, uh, in Cavium NIX is future proof. And all of that is backed by 10 plus years uh, of uh, driver development, software management, operating systems uh, from FreeBSD, Linux, Windows, uh, DPDK, uh, AIX, you name it, uh, <coughs> we support it. Um, <coughs> with that, it's time for me to hand this back to Bob uh, from the Linley Group for some closing comments. Thanks, Nishan. Uh, so just to wrap up here, as we've discussed, there are multiple camps in the RDMA ecosystem across Rocky and iWork. Um, Tevian's FastLink is unique in handling both protocols. The software ecosystem is now in place for network file systems to adopt RDMA over Ethernet. But NVMe over Fabrics is an exciting technology that promises the ultimate in block-level storage performance um, and the ability to scale out across the network. And so overall, the time is right for data center operators, um, whether private cloud or public cloud, to evaluate RDMA for use in their Ethernet and IP networks. 
So thank you, everybody. And at this point, I'm going to turn it to Angel to handle the Q&A session. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, Nishant. Um, yeah, our first question comes from a Andrew. And um, Bob, I'm going to ha uh, hand this question over to you. And his question is, is IWARP and Rocky v2 slower in performance due to IWARP being based on TCP IP protocol and inherited CPU memory requirements on the system? OK, thanks, Andrew. Um, so there are, are two different angles to performance. In terms of absolute latency, iWarp will be a little bit slower in absolute latency. But um, when we're talking about storage applications and live migration applications, the absolute latency difference between iWarp and Rocky in terms of minimum latencies kind of gets lost in the noise. The, the bigger issue is if you have loss in your network, then you will see spikes in latency. Um, and so the, the use of a lossless network for Rocky will avoid those latency spikes and give you a, um, a more deterministic performance. iWarp may suffer from spikes in latency from time to time due to packet loss. Um, there is no CPU or memory overhead due to iWarp because the TCP IP processing is actually done on the NIC. Um, not on the CPU, and so the the overhead on the system between iWarp and Rocky are both the, the overhead is minimal in both cases, and and will be very similar. Thank you, Bob. Um, the next question comes from Rick. What is Cavium's recommendation on maximum number of compute nodes that are ideal for Rocky versus iWarp? I'm going to give this to Nishant. Thank you, uh, Angel. So uh, like we discussed a lot through the presentation, the choices between Rocky and iWarp depends on a whole bunch of uh, things uh, from network, from skill set, lossless or not. But if you kind of narrow that thought process down to the number of compute nodes, and in general, my recommendation and more of a rule of a thumb is uh, anywhere from 32 to perhaps even up to 64 nodes, uh, Rocky V2 uh, with DCQCN will do just fine. and. Uh, if you are looking for scale beyond that, like 128 uh, uh, plus nodes uh, in, the, in the cluster, then perhaps uh, iWarp uh, would be a more scalable option for you. I hope that helps. Thank you, Nishant. Uh, the next question comes from Victor. We, we often hear the word verbs when relating to RDMA. Can you speak to what that means for me as a solution architect? And um, Bob, I'll give that question to you. Okay, thanks. Um, the the term verbs is a bit esoteric and is associated with RDMA and often associated with InfiniBand. It's merely an API um, for uh, RDMA functions, and it is buried in the protocol stack. So if you're using an off-the-shelf stack like the ones we discussed, um, then you really don't have to worry about verbs. You won't be doing any interaction with um, with those uh, with those APIs. Um, Nishan, do you have anything to add to that? Uh, sure, uh, uh, Bob. I think you said it right. Just one thing that I would like to add is uh, consider verbs as an API that allows applications uh, or file systems to interact with the RDMA stack. And what verbs? Uh, I don't know whether it has any related relations to grammar, uh, but uh, what Verbs does is it makes the applications agnostic to what type of RDMA you use underneath. Let's say today you have an environment that you use uh, Rocky with, uh, and uh, the application, your workloads would not need to change if you were to move to iWarp, and that in many ways is brought about uh, by the architecture that implements Verbs. Okay, thank you, Nishan. The next question comes from Cindy. Um, does RDMA come standard with Cavium Ethernet NICs, or is it, or it, or is it a value-added feature? Nishant, can you uh, answer that question? Sure. So. <clears throat> 
from RDMA, be it Rocky or uh, iWarp, is a standard feature in modern uh, new generation NICs from Cavium. So if you obtain uh, a 45,000 series or a 41,000 series or its variants from any of the OEMs uh, uh, that Cavium supplies to, uh, you would get uh, RDMA with it for no additional cost. And that's one of the beauties. So we, we talked about multiple things, right? I mean, 25 gig on one hand gives you two and a half times the bandwidth at a very small price premium. Great options. RDMA is becoming a standard option on, on NICs, uh, and at least it is there for uh, that. So for Cavium, is, uh, you, it's time to leverage the potential of 25 gig Ethernet as well as RDMA. These are available to you as options, and as, like you saw all through the slides, uh, uh, there is a whole bunch of acceleration that these uh, RDMAs can bring to your applications. It's available. Thank you, Nishant. Um, our next question comes from Andrew. Uh, is IWARP versus Rocky slower in performance due to IWARP being based on TCPIP protocol and uh, inherited uh, CPU memory requirements on the system? Can you answer that one, Bob? Uh, yeah, sorry, Angel, we already addressed that one. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I repeated that. Sorry about that. Uh, the last question, um, is uh, coming from Cecile. Um, if you fast forward a few years, how would you imagine the RDMA, both from a NIC vendor support as well as an ecosystem application? Um, Nishant, would you like to answer that? Well, I guess towards the end of the presentation, we are doing some crystal ball gazing uh, and looking uh, forwards. And uh, please, uh, at least uh, this is my personal opinion uh, because I'm looking forward uh, a few years on your demand. Uh, and uh, so a couple of things that I see around RDMA. I, I definitely see RDMA becoming more and more entrenched uh, uh, into applications and ecosystem. And thanks to NVMe, a whole bunch of support from ecosystem, this is bound to happen. I have no doubt in my mind uh, that RDMA is, here to stay and will find new and new applications and homes. Uh, although I do think that today, if you look at the ecosystem around you in terms of uh, Ethernet-based RDMA support, there are some vendors that support only Rocky and some vendors that support only iWarp. Uh, but as we discussed all through the presentation, both have own unique use cases. And uh, I expect uh, that <clears throat> both Rocky and iWarp uh, will be required uh, in the future for applications, and you might expect that uh, others will adapt uh, to make sure they also provide you the options of RDMA moving forward. Just crystal ball gazing. Okay. Thank you, Nishant, and thank you, Bob. Um, that ends our Q&A session. Um, I'd like to now announce the winner of our GoPro. It's a Hero 5 with a dual battery charger. I'd like to present it to Ivan Wood. He is one of our attendees, um, and Ivan will connect with you via email to uh, provide, uh, you know, all the uh, it, so you can provide all the information. But once again, thank you everyone for attending the webinar. It will be posted a day from now, and will be able to be downloaded. Thank you, Angel. Congratulations, Ivan, and uh, thank you, Bob, and thanks everybody for attending. Thanks, Angel. Thanks. Thanks. Okay.